You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. And before we get started with this week's episode, I can't tell you how floored I was this week to see that we got another donation. We want to give another shout out to Robert H. for his donation. And thank you so, so much, Robert, for what you've done. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, Your donation goes right back into paying the cost of putting this podcast together, rolling out an episode each week. And the donations to the show help keep each episode ad-free so we can focus on telling each guest's story without interruption. So thank you again, Robert. It is greatly, greatly appreciated. Guys, I mean, I can't say enough about the reaction that we get to this podcast and how much you guys are reacting to what we're doing. And certainly it's not even us. It's the guests on the podcast. It's their stories that are impactful. It's what they're saying that is really causing the action and reaction from from the listeners and the fans of the show. So I just can't say enough about how floored I was by Robert's donation and how much it really meant to us here at the Hazard Ground. Uh, it was very, very touching, and we certainly appreciate anything you guys want to give. The, the amount is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. But the fact that you're reaching out and wanting to help and wanting to take part in this and be a part of the Hazard Ground means the world to us. Make sure you guys continue to follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, at Hazard Ground Podcast, at Hazard Ground, and of course, leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. With that all out of the way, let's get on to another powerful, impactful story in this week's episode of the Hazard Ground. And joining us this week from our home studio, we actually have two guests right here with me. One of them is a retired lieutenant general in the United States Army who had more than 30 years of service in the Army with multiple deployments overseas, including both Iraq and Afghanistan as well. He also held some high-level jobs in the Army in Washington, D.C., and finished out his career as the deputy commander of United States European Command in Germany. He is Lieutenant General Retired William Garrett joining us. Alongside him is a former Marine NCO who enlisted at the age of 17 and served two combat tours in Iraq. He is Sergeant Retired Tim Bannock joining us as well, and they are both here on behalf of a wonderful organization that we'll get to in just a moment. Lieutenant General Garrett, Tim, welcome. Thank you both so much for being here. But before we get started, I'm curious because you're Army and he's Marines. I I look through everything. I don't see a connectivity in service. So how did you two come about meeting each other? Yeah, Mark, I, uh, I think there is commonality, and the commonality is the fact that uh, we're both veterans. And uh, Tim being a, uh, a Marine infantryman, me being an Army infantryman, that's a, uh, that's a connection for sure. And uh, what brought us together, though, was the uh, Emory Healthcare Veterans okay. Program, and uh, we'll talk about that more as we get into the, into the podcast. All right, so we always start just by asking how people got into the military. You know, you obviously was... A- you got in way after you did, sir, but how would your get you start in the military? Well, for me, I, I attended the uh, University of North Georgia up in Dahlonega, Georgia. Uh, at the time, it was uh, North Georgia College, a small school up there that has, frankly, a, a, an exemplary record of producing Leaders for America. Still does today. Yeah, it does. Uh, in fact, I think the ROTC program up there just won the MacArthur Award uh, I year. still serve with a lot of North Georgia grads. Yeah. So it's very cool. It's fun to be part of that. Uh, great legacy up there. And uh, uh, met my wife up there, was commissioned out of there. And so from lieutenant to lieutenant general, I owe back to the University of North Georgia and try and help out there whenever I can. And Tim, what about you? When and why did you enlist? So I was, uh, I was 18 years old. I had a brother that was actually who joined the, Mar- the Marine Corps two and a half years before me. So... I wanted to follow him. I wasn't. I wasn't ready for college. I didn't know what I wanted to do, um, but I knew I wanted to test myself, and so I picked. I picked the Marine Corps and I picked infantry, and it just. I just felt like it was the, the right thing to do in the time of uh, the time of war, the time of uh, watching a men. Post nine eleven world. That post nine eleven. Okay. Yeah. So two thousand two thousand six is when I went to boot camp. So uh, Iraq had already kicked off as well. Um, when you when you told your family you were going to listen to the Marine Corps, what did they say? I was I was already at uh, Riverside Military Academy over in Gainesville, Georgia. So 
it was planning. I was planning on do it. I think they knew that I wanted to serve, but they didn't want me to be infantry. They uh, they weren't happy about that. Um, they, I think they were scared. My brother was uh, mortuary affairs, so he was he wasn't going outside of base. So I think they were a little nervous for me in the in the time of war picking infantry. That's weird. Your brother was mortuary affairs, and you went infantry. Well, why mortuary affairs? By the way, that's a very specific job in the military. Well, he, he initially went in as an anti-aircraft and then switched over to the mortuary affairs. I he just I think that's just the talent he has. He's just he's, good with dead people. He, he's he's <laughs> he's he's good with helping people who you know. I'm I good guess. with dead people too. They never argue back, so I always usually have have, have enlightened conversations with them. I kid, I but kid. He, once he got out of the military, he did become you know he's a funeral he was a funeral director. A, okay. he was well, and now not anymore yeah. but so it makes sense yeah. it makes sense so so when you joined in the early 80s i mean we're in the post-vietnam sort of era and there's a lull about the military there's sort of a down feel about it i mean i was very very young at the time but um you know did you always know that's what you wanted to do yeah i think for me it grew over time um i i started i guess my first exposure to the military was my dad of course and uh uh, he also encouraged me to pursue it if I was interested in it. Uh, it's interesting. I uh, was it paying for college back then? Yeah, it was. Okay. Yeah, it and, still did back then. Yeah, and here's here's how it worked for me. I, I thought they only got suckers like me. <laughs> I ended up working for uh, something called the Youth Conservation Corps in the summers up in the Chattahoochee National Forest up there. We lived on Camp Frank D. Merrill, which is the mountain ranger camp. So I lived there for uh, four summers uh, while we worked in the Chattahoochee National Forest uh, on the Appalachian Trail, parks and things like that up there. So uh, as part of that geographic proximity to North Georgia College, um, I, that's where I made the connection uh, between what I was doing in the summer and the school. That's what kind of pushed me over to the school. But to be frank, the, uh, the most uh, formative experience I had, and I've talked about this with with Tim, is the exposure I had there to uh, the ranger instructors. So I'm a 16, 17, 18-year-old working up there with the Forest Service, but we're living on the mountain ranger camp. So we had these senior NCOs, all Vietnam veterans, many who had achieved the rank of captain and then in the post-war uh, years had been pushed back to sergeant first class or master sergeant. But they're all up there, and they're running this program uh, to uh, train and, and prepare rangers. And I was drawn to that. And uh, the fact that it was out of doors, it was doing some pretty cool things, that also attracted me. So it was a natural evolution from that kind of background to the ROTC program there at uh, North Georgia College, now the University of North Georgia. Well, and I think the, the, the major difference, obviously, Tim, you joined up knowing you were going to war. So when you joined up, you war wasn't even like a thing. Like, we had just gotten out of one. We're not looking for another one. Uh, we were embroiled in two of them. So I'm curious from your perspective standpoint, Tim, start with you, just, you know, knowing you were going to war, how much of that really entered into your mind in the whole process? And was it, I don't want to say were you excited to do it. I don't think anybody's excited to go, but you kind of just understood it was the nature of what, what was going to go on. I think I, I, I don't think I had an idea of what I was getting myself into. Um, I was excited to, to, to serve my country. I was excited to be part of something that was bigger than myself. But knowing that I could go to war, I think it was to test myself. I wanted to see if I was a, if I was capable of of being a combat marine, and I I I did it, and it it was the scariest thing I ever had to do. But I overcame it, and it it, it taught me that I would I'm, I'm stronger than I ever I ever knew. I mean, I was able to face combat. I was able to withstand what happened to see the IEDs and be able there to be there to come home and, and, and continue to live my life. So for you, though, did, is your first taste of combat after 9-11? Because that's 20 years after you commissioned. No, let's see. Uh, I've got a little more skin in the game than that. Uh, I, I assume that just, you know, yeah. I mean, there was a lot of little skirmishes that popped up along right. the way, um, but not everybody got to be a part of that. Right. And uh, for me and the, the young leaders that I served with in those days, um, uh, it was the post Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. So there was uh, a residual, uh, challenge with some of the, uh, some of the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, as that generation, uh, moved on, moved on out. And we, uh, we began recruiting in the Reagan era, 
uh, very bright, smart people uh, into the military and uh, a chance to serve with them. You know, pretty amazing privilege, I think, for any of us. And, uh, to, you know, to serve with guys like Tim uh, as well, uh, just it's it's quite an opportunity. And I think in terms of skirmishes and things along the way, you know, your uh, deployments to the Sinai in those days was a, was a big deal. We deployed to Grenada, uh, uh, things like that. And uh, so there was enough going on in the world to, to keep a, a young, young man busy in those days. Um, where were you on 9-11? On 9-11, I was, let's see, I was in the Pentagon. Oh, really? Yeah. I was in the Pentagon uh, serving on the staff of the Secretary of the Army as his military assistant. Uh, I was on, literally on the phone with my wife uh, uh, talking about what was occurring in New York City and uh, watching the first plane and then the second plane go into the Twin Towers. And she goes, uh, so you think you're going to be okay there? And I said, this is the Pentagon. Nothing like that would happen here. Literally, as soon as I said that, there was a, a big, loud thump. We had uh, paint chips coming off the ceiling, dust coming out of the carpet. And uh, I thought it was a, uh, uh, a car bomb that somebody had set off in South Parking there at the Pentagon. I had no idea uh, that it was a, you know, an airliner. So I, I grabbed my, my boss, a colonel at the time, and he and I uh, hustled out of the Pentagon and around the corner. I think we were the first two uniformed people to arrive at the at the site, as I recall. And as we ran up to it, um, he goes, you know, I, th I think a small plane or a helicopter has, they've, terrorists have flown it into the, into the Pentagon. As we got closer, I could see the wheel assembly sitting there of the airliner. And I said, boss, I don't think so. I think this is a little bit bigger than that. And at the time, it was uh, literally a smoking hole in the Pentagon. All of the fire and things you saw later, that had not happened yet. The plane had entered the Pentagon, and if you look at the videotapes uh, later, uh, you can see a bright flash, and then the plane it basically is, disintegrates. Yeah, and it disintegrates inside of the Pentagon. So there's there's nothing on the outside except literally a smoking hole, and me and Colonel Joe Shordell, I think his name was, uh, standing there looking at it, scratching our heads, going, "Well, we, you know, we got to get inside and help people." And so it was a very long day. And, Understatement. Uh, yep. And uh, I, I do remember going home about midnight that night, and the Pentagon is burning, and then coming back at about four in the morning the next day, and the Pentagon is still burning. And, uh, you know, we just uh, got in there and, and did what we could to ensure that things kept running. Just for a visual, if you can, for the listeners, in relation to where the plane hits, where are you in the building? At what ring? I know there's five different rings yeah. on the inside, A, right, B, C, right. D, and E. Um, and the E is the outer ring. Right. So um, where were you in relation? Like, let's just for viewers' sake, if you put your, your hand up in front of your face, the base of your palm is where the plane enters. Mm -hmm. where, where are you in relation to that? So I, I was in the E ring. That's the outer ring. And I was, uh, say, two turns from where the impact was. So basically, if the if, if, again, if the bottom yeah. of your hand is in a northwest direction mm -hmm. of where it was, okay, mm -hmm. on, that, on that sort of sure. panel of it. Sure. Wow. Yep. Yep. So an interesting day and not one that uh, any of us ever want to see repeated again, obviously. I mean, at that point, are, are, it's weird because when we ask people where they are on 9-11, um, and, and Tim, I'm curious from a civilian standpoint where you are, I want to get to that in a minute, but you know, people who were in uniform at the time and everybody knew it, um, we're all thinking, okay, we're going. We, we got to go. We got to go. We got to go. Um, you as a Pentagon guy, you knew you weren't going anywhere, right? I knew it was just a matter of time. Well, yes, but I'm just, I, I guess I'm just saying initially, uh, is your thinking, uh, when do we start planning for the attack? Like, how, what, do you, what's, what thoughts are going through your mind? Yeah, so I, I think for all of us there, uh, uh, you, when you're standing outside of the Pentagon watching it burn, um, we did a, we did evacuate the secretary of the army to an offsite location immediately by helicopter. Uh, he asked if secretary of defense was also at that location with him. And we told him, no, he said, bring the Blackhawks back. And so we took him back into the Pentagon from that offsite location. We evacuated wow. to, and, uh, we went down into the emergency ops center 
uh, of the Army kind of uh, headquarters down in the basement, and uh, a lot of smoke, that kind of thing, but uh, it was okay to operate. And the Secretary of the Army and uh, uh, Chief Staff of the Army uh, set up shop down there on 9-11 and began planning how the Army was going to support the larger response uh, of America to this uh, attack by the terrorists. So well, planning literally started right yeah, away. But I'm, yeah. Everybody who's military knows this. First thing, rule number one, establish security. Was that what you were planning for at that point in time? Are, we, are you looking at, you're not looking at going on the offensive. You're looking at making sure everything is secure in the next 24, 48 hours, correct? Yeah, it's a little of both. So we're, uh, we're talking about, okay, so what do we need to do to make sure our military installations are on a heightened sense of alert, security, those kinds of things. But at the same time, you know, we need that big fist of America getting ready to go. So there's a whole readiness issue that kicks in at that point to make sure we can generate the forces uh, that the nation needs to to deal with those who caused that uh, uh, terrible day for us. Tim, I, I know that you were not in the Pentagon on 9-11. Where were you? I was, I was in a middle school classroom. That's what I figured, yeah. yeah I, was, I was a young boy, but I, I remember everything stopping that day, and I remember the teachers turning on the TV and them crying and then me going home and my mom crying and because she was supposed to fly out that day and it, her flight got canceled but i remember that day just like a lot of the other veterans that i i i you know have served alongside me we we don't specifically remember the details but we remember that that fight that we all felt inside to protect yeah. one another and to protect our country I'm, I'm i'm a new york kid i spent the day trying to find all my friends in manhattan and and trying to get through to a phone call in new york on that day was impossible it was impossible. My brother had to walk across the Brooklyn Bridge to get home. Uh, I had a couple of friends on Wall Street. It took me forever. Um, high school classmate of mine was worked for Cannon Fitzgerald. We all know what happened with that company. Uh, family friend was in the in the towers. It was just it was an awful, awful, awful day, you know. But uh, I, I I remember thinking I called and at the time prior to 9-11, they were kicking people off active duty, right? Because the the military was downsized during the Clinton administration. They were Correct. so. I had I had spent my first you know uh, two and a half years on on active duty at Fort Hood, but they were kicking people out, and so they were basically offering people to go to the National Guard. So I literally two months earlier I had just gotten to the National Guard, and I remember calling everybody in my army. All right, I'm here. Where are we going? Where are we, what are we doing? But it never occurred to me we were immediately going to war. Like I knew something was going to happen. I just it never. I don't know why I'm like a dummy like that. Like I just never thought like okay we're going to go somewhere. I just knew we had to do something, right? And I felt like I was just like everybody else. We got to do something. We can't just sit here. And so. Anyway, uh, you know, awful, awful times. All right, so let's kind of fast forward a little bit. Um, you, Tim, you had two deployments to Iraq. What sir, years were they? Uh, 2007 and 2008. Okay. When do you, sir, when do you first get into the war on terror? Yeah, so I deployed uh, 2003 uh, to Afghanistan okay. as an uh, infantry brigade commander. Um, as you recall, in 2003, uh, most of the effort was going toward Iraq. Right. So there was only one brigade at the time, one infantry brigade at the time uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, we ended up turning that into a task force. So we had uh, Italian uh, paratrooper battalion with us. We had a Romanian mechanized battalion with us. We had uh, lots of smaller elements from other countries with us. The uh, very first deployment of the French uh, military into Afghanistan occurred uh, as part of our team. We had uh, Task Group Eris, which was their SEAL Team 6 equivalent, uh, showed up to work with us, uh, fabulous warriors, uh, still in touch with many of them today. And so, uh, yeah, so that was uh, my first uh, foray into that was 2003-2004 uh, with uh, the mighty 1st Brigade of the uh, 10th Mountain Division. Uh, I was, they were in Iraq when I was there the first time. Uh, 10th, I don't know what brigade was there, but uh, they were. Can never forget those cross swords sitting at the top of their uh, their, their headquarters. Um, I'm curious to know the vantage point and perspective from a grunt on the ground to a 0506 level commander. Um, and again, you went to Iraq later on. Oh, by the way, we were in Iraq together at the same time in 2011. I recognize you now. <laughs> Fair, I doubt it. Um, but uh, it, does the name Bernard Champeau ring a bell to you? Bernie Champeau, old friend. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I served on the, under him on the 25th. So Good man. Um, I served, uh, I took over 1st Battalion, 27th Infantry Regiment, the Wolfhounds from Bernie Champeau. 
Really? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Uh, he went on to get his third star. Now, he right? did. Yeah. He did. Okay. Is he yeah. still in? Uh, he is retired. He yeah. is retired now. Yeah. Um, vexing man. Hard to read. Very hard to read. <laughs> I was around him a lot, and I'm just a you know. He, 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 there are times when you thought his head was going to explode, and he just smiled at you. And there are times you didn't realize his head was going to explode, and it exploded, and people went running for cover. So um, I never really got a good beat on him, but uh, I didn't know him all that well, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but I'm curious about the perspectives. Anyway, I, we digress. About the perspectives. You know, you get on the ground in Iraq as an infantryman. Is it for you just survive? I had to get in the, the mindset. I mean, I was 19 years old, so I... I just came. I just graduated high school. I just got through boot camp. I. It happened that quick. So you. Were I mean, boot camp. I uh, boot camp August and deployed in April. Wow. So I graduated boot camp in August 18th, and I was yeah. We deployed to Fallujah, Iraq, and um. I mean, you were school of infantry right after that. Like you re- right, literally, bam, bam, bam. There into the you know into the fleet and right to deploying. Yeah. So where in Iraq did you go? Uh, Fallujah, Iraq. Okay. So El Ambar province. So we were. And this was 07 or 06? 07. 07, 07 okay. Yeah. So we were, I was there from. I think from april to november i think okay. and um it was honestly when we got there we show up in the middle of the night i look you know we, we show up to to tq and then we go from tq to fallujah and i'm i'm looking outside you know the seven ton and you just see my first sight is a destroyed city fallujah is just there's just buildings with you know bullet holes half blown up i was at that moment i just your brothers in 06 did most of that. Yeah, it was it was eye opening. It was and and it put now looking back, it was those were those were men. Every those were those were people just like me, Marines just like me there fighting to survive and and just being there at 19 years old was I, I didn't know. I didn't I just wanted to make it home. And to be honest, on my second deployment, I just we had, people in the, the military have thoughts like I want to I want to I want to. I want to turn twenty one. Like I want to. I want to drink. You know, alcohol legally. That was one of my biggest like things on my second deployment. Was like maybe maybe I'll make it to twenty one so I can get home and drink alcohol. So that was a pretty big realization that I was living a different kind of life than my college friends and then and my civilian friends. Yeah, um, we talk a lot about on the podcast the coming to grips with your own mortality uh, and how different people handle it and and uh, what it does to different people and part of the you know, PTSD uh, and post-traumatic stress that people deal with is not understanding how to come to grips with it when they're in it and then kind of comes up and sneaks up on them on the backside. But, you know, uh, so I want to ask you because, I, and then I, Tim, I want to get your reaction. And I only know this from my own service, you know, as a uh, company level commander in my first deployment, being where the rubber meets the road and being in the fight on a routine basis, you know, moving up now through a battalion command, you know, as officers and leaders, we're forced to change our view, right? I mean, for the grunt on the ground, their view is fairly similar and static most of the time, as, as is their ability to affect what's in front of them. It's it's a small, narrow path. But as you go up the chain as an officer, your your view widens, and you don't have a choice but to look at things from a, a 30,000-foot view. And the idea of mission accomplishment for a grunt on the ground is vastly different for a brigade-level commander. So when you're in Afghanistan and you are tasked with whatever the mission set was. Um, when you define mission accomplishment there, it's probably different than what the men who served under you felt, the men and women who served under you felt. Yeah, I think you're right, Mark. I, I also know that uh, uh, for every soldier, sailor, airman, and marine that was over there with me in 2003 to four, there was no doubt why we were there or what our mission was. And uh, every... Uh, soldier, sailor, airman, or marine that I met, or special operator that I met, I gave one of my coins, and it showed the Twin Towers and never forget. And that was just to reinforce them, uh, to them, why we were there. But they didn't need that coin. They knew why they were there. Many of them enlisted, you know, like Tim did, because they were looking to take the fight back uh, to the people who had ran those airplanes into those towers. So there was no doubt about why they were there. It's funny you said that. I remember, so when I took my first command over in Iraq, uh, it was a sort of put-together unit. You know, they, they had a, re- a request for forces, and they put together this whole unit and tabbed me as the commander. So all these people in the room I had never been with. Most of them I had barely even known. And I remember the first thing I said when I got in front of the entire company, um, I brought with me 
the Time Magazine the week after 9-11 that had the two towers, one of them exploding yeah. with the second plane hitting and the other one burning. And I said to everybody, I said, I don't know what's in front of us and I don't know what we have to do and what our mission 100% is yet at this point. But I can tell you this thing, and I held up that magazine in front of everybody. This is why we're going. And it doesn't even matter that it's Iraq. This is why we're here. And don't ever forget it. I did the same exact thing you did, sir. It was the same exact speech that yeah. I just wanted that image to stay with them. Sure. To remind them that even though it's Iraq and it's not, you know, the same people or we didn't know it was, whatever, you get the point. But it was just, if that event doesn't happen, I know we're not sitting in this room getting ready to go somewhere else right now. Yeah, and they were, you know, they were ready to fight. Uh, I remember 187 Infantry, when they landed at Kandahar, they came out of the back of the C-130, all of their gear on, all of their kit on, ready to fight. And the battalion executive officer at the time let them out, and he goes, where's the range? And I remember... <laughs> Remember, so I get range. What are you talking about? And he goes, yeah, we need to zero our weapons one more time before we get into the fight. I mean, that's mm. mentally how focused they were wow. on getting after it. Because, again, in 2003, they knew why they were there. And the mission in Afghanistan morphed over the years. But uh, in those days, there was no, deb- no doubt about uh, uh, what they were trying to do. One other footnote. I could tell you that when I was back in Iraq the second time in 2011, I did not have that same... And, and the funny part about Iraq in 2011 was I kept telling everybody, we're coming here to leave. Like In and of itself, we knew we were leaving at the end of 2011 when we got there, which to me felt counterproductive to begin with. Why are you sending people? I get that, you know, but if a unit is leaving in the beginning of 2011, just leave it alone. Yeah. You know, it was, and it was much different. There were no kinetic operations, let me rephrase. There were kinetic operations for the certain people, but for 90% of the forces on ground, it couldn't have been more of a garrison thing. I mean, 5K runs and yeah. formations and ceremony and everything else, and you're sitting here wondering, like, it, it gets to a point, at, especially when you do high-level stuff, you know, when you, 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 you're, where every day your, your emotions and your senses are on high alert to go to just this completely backwards picture of that. It's really, really tough sometimes. Yeah, and it's a big challenge, I think, for leaders, particularly junior leaders, who have to instill that sense of urgency. And they're the men and women who are out there making it happen every day. And how do we keep them on their toes and focused, knowing that we're closing closing up shop and uh, and heading back at some point? Let's talk about kind of casualties and what that does to you. Did Tim? Did you guys experience any while you were over there? So I I didn't experience any casualties on both of my deployments. I experienced wow. um, I experienced roommates getting blown up and and seeing them have to like one of my uh, one of my buddies was. His name's um, Ben, um, and he he got blown up. And he last thing I saw of him, last time I've seen him, he was in a Black Hawk, and he was getting take you know taken to to wherever he was getting taken to. So I think that just the effects of seeing your friends hurt for me, I, I I've never had experience casualty. I've I've seen um, you know terrorists killed. I've seen I've seen the aftermaths of of that. I've seen aftermaths of IEDs, but just, just, I don't know, just experiencing you, at such a young age, your friends, yourself, others getting hurt. It's just, uh, it's that stays with you forever. How much different do you think, or more prepared do you think you would have been had you experienced them those same things later on in life? I mean, obviously, experience dictates it, but there is no combat, there's no experience like combat experience. I mean, sometimes there are people who are in their late 20s who have experienced more loss in life through death of friends family things of that nature but it's still not combat it's not the same thing i think for me if i was older i think i would have made smarter choices with how in regards to to like i was leading my men and how i how i led them I'm not saying i did a bad job but i just i was so immature i was 19 year 19 years old 20 years old in charge of five marines or four marines um i think i would have been a, be, a better leader i think i would have been so? I just like you know, like everyone knows, with age, you just learn more about yourself. You learn more about life. You you have time to think about the choices you've made, and you have time to to realize that you made those choices. And you, yeah, like I, I, I probably would have, if at the same time, you know, if I was a nineteen year old marine, I would still made those same um, choices now. But I think I, I could have, I think I could have been a better leader. Now that I'm thirty two, have some years on me, you know, I've gotten educated i've i've learned a little about life and now i i think i think being a leader is is knowing your men and knowing your women and knowing how to relate to them and i don't i think i was 
I was just a Marine, a combat Marine who experienced combat and I knew how to, to lead men in it, but I didn't know how to actually lead these, these people to become better, better people coming outside the military. So I wish I could have been there to, to talk with them, to explain that this is going to be okay. And that, you know, we, we, we all experience this, this, this together, but you know, it's important to, to stay as brothers and, and to be tight. And I think Tim hits on a good point, which is the need for, uh, leaders to have some empathy for the, uh, the people they lead and serve. And the fact that uh, not every soldier, not every Marine, uh, not every special operator is going to be super experienced and able to deal necessarily with something. But, you know, that's also where training kicks in. And the fact that if you've got a chance to train your team and put them through some hard, relentless iterations, uh, when they get into a, a situation that uh, uh, in combat, the training kicks in, gets you through that situation, and then you can work with them as a leader to to deal with the emotional impacts of what they've just experienced. But to ignore it and try and bottle that emotion up is going to have a bad outcome. I'm not sure if anything, you know, happened to the guys that the men and women who were under you, but there there is a general feeling of you just got to turn the page because the next day happens and the next mission happens and uh, in combat life goes on. It, it doesn't, you know, it, it pauses for no reason. Uh, it, it's unforgiving when it comes to people who get killed. And um, a, a lot of that too is a big portion, a big part of where post-traumatic stress comes from because it never really is a decompression period. Um, and as much as we've talked to people on the pod where leaders have been, listen, you need to sit the next couple out. People don't want to, they, they don't want to sit the next one out. They just want to get back into it. Cause sometimes the old adage work is good for grief sort of, you know, gets you through some of the tough times, but uh, all that stuff eventually catches up with you. So how do, how did you deal with that with the, the people you were in command of? Yeah, Mark, I, I think you're, uh, the, the analogy you used, uh, that you used, work is good for grief. That, that works while you're in the moment, while you're in combat. But uh, after is the, is the challenge. And I, I think the uh, U.S. military, the Department of Defense, uh, has struggled to uh, find a way to ensure that when our, uh, our uh, soldiers, Marines, come out of combat, there is a way for them to, uh, to talk it out, to have a chance to uh, work through what they've experienced. Certainly uh, uh, for people who've experienced trauma, uh, there should be no surprise uh, that uh, you know, PTSD is going to happen. I think over the National Psychiatric Association says over 3 million Americans are diagnosed with PTSD every year. Those are just the ones that, you know, have gone. That come forward, yeah. yeah. exactly. So PTSD is common, and we should accept that and have a plan to, uh, to, to deal with it. It's, uh, it's not going away. It's been around forever. Um, but to ignore it and allow people to uh, become isolated or bottle that up, That'll just eat at you for the rest of your life if you let it. And it'll put you in a downward spiral in life uh, that could end up uh, with a bad outcome. I was just want to reiterate what I said earlier. So when it, for me, what I've learned going through the Emory Veterans Program and what I've learned from being a, a young, young Marine who I only reached corporal. I'm, I'm around, you know, these, these high ranking officers <laughs> and, but I, after going through Emory and learning that, like, I knew that I was strong enough, like I needed to learn that I was strong enough and needed to know that I could do it myself. That's what I wish I could have showed my Marines that like shown them through my own, my own struggles that it's okay to be weak. It's okay to be hurting. It's okay to cry. But you know, like most Marines and most you know, young military members, you, you, you turn to alcohol, you turn to other activities to get your mind off of what you're doing because it's, it's a dangerous life. Like you said, I mean, you every day, like, I don't want to miss if I would have gotten blown up, I don't want to miss being out there because what if that's the last time I get to, to see one of my friends? What if that's the last time I get to see one of my brothers or sisters? And you don't want having that feeling of knowing that you could have done something, even though, you know, maybe you couldn't have that's a very hard feeling for any, anybody. 
And so, and in the military, you don't want to be weak. They teach you to be tough. They teach you, you know, those guys went to the mental health. They're not going to go on this deployment, you know, but now after I get out, like, I think I, the, the type of leader I, I, I am now, and I want to be to other military members is that like, it's okay to feel hurt. It's okay to wake up every day and, 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 and know that you're hurting. It's, it's okay to think about Iraq, but it's not okay to stay there. It's not okay to, to keep yourself in a state of constant hurt and constant mourning and treating people and yourself in a different way. You, you, you as a military member need to prove to yourself and to your other, you know, leaders that you served with that you can be strong by, by, by fighting for your life. That's what I did. I fought for my life. And now I want to fight and show, I don't like doing any of this. Like this is all very vulnerable and scary for me, but the fact that I can help somebody and I can show future Marines that if you or army members or whatever branch you are in, like you just need to fight. You need to fight for yourself, fight for your brothers and you need to fight for, for your right to live. Cause you've earned that by signing up, giving your life away and saying, I will do what it takes to keep America safe. And then we, you know, you get out and you, that you kind of still have the mentality that you need to stay in that. And it's not okay. I think you need to need to fight the same way you fought when you're in and you need to fight for yourself and for your loved ones. And you need to show them that it's capable of, 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 of change. Yeah. I think Tim's right. And I think the, uh, the key thing we need our, our veterans to do is to, to look around and say, man, even the strongest of us need some help sometime. And there's nothing um, wrong with uh, getting treatment for PTSD. I mean, I've already mentioned the fact that uh, a large number of Americans, surprisingly large number of, Amer of Americans, are diagnosed with this every year. Why would you carry this monkey around on your back when it's treatable? We can get rid of it. Uh, why? There's no good reason to have PTSD. Well, I, I can uh, – I, it's funny you bring that up because – I've only discovered this uh, recently through actually doing this podcast. Uh, a previous guest, Pasha Palanker, um, who came to us through the Headstrong Project, um, we got into a really kind of raw emotional discussion about the whole thing. Um, and I am somebody through my experience, and I, I, I say this more routinely on the podcast now because I only have recently become more comfortable doing it. That I would guarantee you that if I went to a provider and said I am experiencing PTSD or I have symptoms of it, they would probably diagnose me with it. Um, I have yet to do that, and there's a couple of reasons why. Um, and I say this really. One, I'm still in. I'm still serving, and I don't want to be taken out of the fight. Um, that's number one. Number two, um, having gone through the VA process and being on VA disability, I don't want to go down that road again. It's, it is way more effort than whatever they're going to give me money-wise to me, um, even if it pushed me at like 100% disabled. I just, I don't need to go through it again. It's, it, 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 it doesn't draw me enough. Three, I don't feel like I'm debilitated by it. I can get through everyday life. I may have episodes. I may have issues here and there. But for the most part, I lead a pretty comfortable life. As well, there are people who need it more than me. And if I get in line, I may be in front of somebody else who needs it more and quicker than I do. And I don't want to impede someone else from doing it. Um, I do have concerns. I do have fears. And for some reason, you know, things start to have started to come up more recently than normal. Um, but I, I just feel at this point, you know, um, my biggest concern, and he, I think for people who may be struggling with it, Pasha, the, the guy I mentioned before, had said to me, he was worried about passing it on to his kids. And when he said that to me, it really hit home and, and, it, and it literally brought me to tears because that's what made me go, wow, I may have an issue. And I don't want to turn my kids into angry kids because dad snaps when things don't go the right way because it's just a reaction and something, a behavior that I didn't even learn. It just sort of developed um, through my experience in combat. And, and I think for anybody listening, that is something that really awoke me to the idea that there may be an issue. Yeah, Mark, I know that, um, you know, I, I'm not a medical expert. I'm a simple infantryman. But I can tell you that uh, PTSD is a disorder of avoidance. And uh, it's very common. Uh, the reasons you described, we, uh, we've heard those a number of times. Um, I can cope with it. 
I don't want to get in line in front of people who need it more than I do. Those kind of things are very common reasons we hear for not uh, getting treated. But the point is, um, it can be treated. And you don't have to necessarily go to the VA to do that. And Tim has mentioned the Emory Healthcare Veterans Program. It's a good transition to get there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's, an, it's easy to access. You just go to the website, check it out, call the 1-800 number. They'll do an uh, interview with you to make sure that uh, everything is organized for you. They'll bring you in. You'll get some highly effective treatment. The intensive outpatient program that uh, Tim went through, for example, that's two weeks of, uh, of solid, nonstop, all day long therapy. And you have homework at night and you have homework on the weekends. But you come out of that in a better place. And uh, the best thing about it, uh, it doesn't cost you a penny. So you're getting the world's best PTSD treatment at no cost. So for veterans out there that are listening in who are struggling with PTSD or no other veterans who are, please direct them to the Emory Healthcare Veterans Program. I'll turn it over to Tim to talk about it some more, but it's a it's it's pretty amazing. Well, I, before it's, I want to hear this, Tim, but I just want to kind of help with the transition a little bit. One, how you got out of the Marine, how and why you got out of the Marine Corps, and then how and why did you get to a point where you realized you needed help? So I got out. I got out in 2010 off active duty. Like everybody else, went to college, um, still living my life, trying to find find my purpose. Was going to school, and you know it. It wasn't until, gosh, uh, almost you know, nine years later after I got out that I had my episodes. My parents would see it. You know, I was probably drinking more or just attitude or the same mindset. Like I, I just don't want to go do or help myself. I can do it on my own. And I just I lived a life of going to work every day. And then going home and just not being happy, putting on the face that I'm, I'm good. And I honestly, once I, I met my wife, my wife, Clada, she's um, she honestly changed, changed my entire world and my whole outlook on myself. And she she mentioned this program and I I knew that I if I wanted to keep her that I needed to I needed to, to change because I never had met anyone that loved me that much, but she she made me believe that it wasn't okay to stay in the current state I was because I just do you remember what she said to you? She just, she just, she mentioned that her, fr she had, she kind of said something like, Hey, I have a friend who like knows about this great veterans program over at Emory and like, it really helps people out. And it was, she, she just knew that I needed help. And so I, to make her happy, I was like, okay, I'll go do my interview. And little did I know it, it, it is a program where you have people that truly want to help people who are just there to listen. And then you have so many military memories there that have been through kind of like the same thing you have. And Was in, there a moment for you going through this where the light bulb clicked on? Yes. Like that seminal moment. Tell me about it. What, yes. What, so what happened? like uh Burke was saying, I went, I actually went twice. So I went, I went the first time I couldn't complete it. But you know what? The thing that made me believe in this program even more was they didn't give up on me. Why, why, didn't, why couldn't you complete it? I just wasn't emotionally. I was. I just emotionally needed to learn how to deal with. So I needed more counseling, like kind of DBD training, learning how to control my behavior, to be able to 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 really take in what they were what they were uh, teaching me. And so my uh, my counselor, Dr. Kelsey Sprang, got me introduced with another uh, Emory. Um, counselor who was able to help me kind of get into more no wait hold on. so when you didn't get through the first time i'm curious i feel like there's two reactions there one is screw it i'm not going back or the other one is well damn i failed now i gotta go back and pass it which he, one were you he, in tim didn't have a choice oh. Cla <laughs> clara his wife nudged him right back in again uh it, i think I, I, I that was actually the turning point once once i was talking to dr kelsey sprang who was my counselor and we had gotten something and i think i'd stormed out crying to be honest, I was done crying and I came back in and she's crying to me and she's like, I'm not giving up on you. Like, I'm not going to give up on you. This program's not going to give up on you. So you have all these people that like legitimately don't, all they want to do is help you. And so I'm, I'm breaking down. I'm crying. She's crying. That's and a lot of emotions being thrown around in the same room. In the same room. <laughs> and it, I was, I, I, I just, what the hell happened to me? <laughs> I think as a military member, you want 
or just a military person, you want to be with something that has your back, someone that has your back, an organization that has your back. You know, you have your brothers and the brothers and sisters in the military that always there for you and have your six and you have, they're always going to be your buddy. But here you have a program where you have these counselors that actually want to help. So for me, the light bulb moment was her saying, I'm not giving up on you and me being like, well, I'm not going to give up either. Then I'm just, I can't give up. I have to keep pushing. So I went through this stuff. I came back and then I found that like, Oh, Holy crap. Like all you actually listen to what they're saying. You go through this intensive. I mean, these, these counseling sessions are not, they're hard. That's they're, they're harder than Iraq. They're harder than anything I've ever done in my life. They're the hardest thing I've ever had to do, but you walk through it. And then you realize that you have the power, like you as an individual have the power to overcome anything that you're going through military wise. Yes. Do I struggle every day? Yes. Just like you, like I struggle, but they gave me the tools that I, I just go back to, I ground myself. I remind myself that like 19 year old Tim, if you went back, you would have done the same thing. But if you would have known differently, maybe if you would have known something during this raid, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have, maybe if you would have known the, the, the situation, you would have reacted differently, but I can't do that. I did everything in my power as a 19, 20 year old kid. I would do the same thing today. So it's just realizing that like you have it. It's okay to know that you did things you're not proud of, but you were in war. I was a 19, 20 year old kid. How are you going to react in war? No one knows until you're actually in war and no one understands unless you've been to war. And I just realized that I could do it. And it was the most amazing feeling I've ever gotten in my life because it was like for the first time I felt like I I actually had control over my feelings about Iraq and that was the most rewarding thing I've ever experienced in my life when you so when you hear him say that you know what comes to your mind well the the effectiveness of the program uh is remarkable and if if you and I know Mark you're asking well don't we have the VA doesn't the VA do this the VA does, but uh, there's a bigger issue at play. And uh, when 9-11 happened and we went to war in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, we did not uh, enlarge or resource the VA to deal it's with... The same the, as it's been since Vietnam. Yeah, to deal with the outcome of a war. So uh, uh, we began getting veterans coming back from the fight uh, with uh, PTSD, with TBI, and other issues. And the VA was not ready to, to handle that. So uh, organizations like the Wounded Warrior Project and others stood up to try and help where they could. In the case of the Wounded Warrior Project, they stood up the Warrior Care Network, four academic medical centers in America, UCLA, Rush up in Chicago, uh, Boston, and then uh, down here in Atlanta with Emory. Those four academic medical centers uh, began picking up a lot of the PTSD treatment and things like that to help out at the VA. Because as you know yourself, and it says it right on their website, um, about 50% of veterans don't interact with the VA in any way, shape, or form. So we've got we've to have a mechanism out there to help them um, as they struggle to come to grips with PTSD and TBI and things like that. And these four academic medical centers under the overall umbrella of the uh, uh, Warrior Care Network, which is partially heavily funded by uh, the Wounded Warrior Project, works. Let me ask you, sir, because uh, I'm curious how, I didn't even ask you this before, but how you came into contact with Emory. You had a 30-year career in the military, uh, and, and you decide, obviously, it's going to do something different. Was this the first thing you did after you got out, or how did you end up connected with Emory? No, I, I've done some uh, security consulting, leadership consulting, that kind of thing. But uh, a friend is that what my... every general does when they retire? Is that, <laughs> is, that like the st- is that the afterlife for generals? Just go do some consulting on leadership. <laughs> so uh, a friend of mine, uh, Lieutenant General Retired Ken Keene, who works at the uh, Gozetta Business School at Emory University, uh, called me one day and said, uh, listen, there's a program here that uh, needs – you know, need some help. Uh, the, they don't have a lot of military experience. It's about 50-odd doctors and clinicians, but no real military uh, experience in there, and uh, maybe you can help. And so I uh, went down there, took a look at the program, was impressed, uh, and then uh, 
the very last thing uh, of the day that I was down there, the very last event that occurred was they put me in a room with uh, Tim Bannock. And, oh, really? Uh, <laughs> Didn't know it at the time. Tim, I remember. <laughs> I said, man, this if, if a program can have an outcome like this and, and have such an impact, I've got to be part of this. I've got to be part of this in some way, shape, or form. So I... Literally that day, I signed on to be their advisor and to help and try and, and add value where I could. And uh, Tim and I became uh, friends, I think, on that day and have been good buds ever since. So do you, you say you don't remember that day? You don't remember him being there or you don't remember that day? I, do, I don't remember that day. I remember, really? I remember me. I just don't remember that. Yeah, the whole, everything about that program is just, you're so focused in on. Oh, so this is when you were in the middle of the program or the end of the program. Yes. Okay. And so you, yeah, you had no Tim, idea that he was Tim. There. Tim was finishing finishing. Do you the remember what he said? And they brought in this, you know, this retired guy to to chat with him. And that's probably all all Tim remembers. But I remember it very distinctly. Yes. What, what do you remember? I remember the uh, the look in Tim's eye as he was describing how the program had turned his life around. And uh, when you see something like that, and you can feel the energy coming off of him, you know that you want to be part of something like this because it's real. It works. It has an impact, and it's changing lives. And who could not want to be part of something like that? It's amazing. Um, serendipity, if you will. That, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and your relationship has flourished ever since? Yeah, we're good buds, and our, our wives are good friends, and we go out and eat uh, dinner together and drink coffee together and have fun. Yeah. Wow. Um, let's get reflective for a moment. Uh, Tim, look back on your service. Uh, anything you do different? Anything you change? I think I would, uh, I think I would like to change a lot of things, but I think I've learned that that's okay to, it's okay to want to change things. It's okay that, you know, I wish I was maybe a little bit better of a leader, a little bit better of maybe I, I wish I didn't, you know, maybe I took advantage of more of going to college or doing certain things that the military offers. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm at this stage of my life. Like I'm actually very, I'm very happy with my military service. I'm very happy I'm happy to talk about it. I was never like that before. Maybe like you were saying, like, you know, you just, you don't feel like you need to talk about it. You want to keep inside. Maybe if you're around other veterans, you'll bring up that you were Iraq war veteran, but you're not going to tell specifics. Now I have no, t I, like I, I want to, I, my main purpose for my healing process and for just living my life is to completely and continuously be as vulnerable and open to a you know anybody as possible because I think that's who we need. Like what I learned from the military service is that it's it's you know we yeah the special forces and some of these other guys are doing a lot of combat stuff in Iraq, Afghanistan, all over the world. But we also have a lot of people who are just basic O three elevens or combat engineers or someone who's just experienced combat that thinks you know little bits of combat that that, that thinks that you know, that's not enough to go and get help for. And I just, I want to be the person now to tell these people, like, it, it's okay to go out there and get help. You need to get help. Everybody who served, who experienced something deserves to get help. You've earned that right. You deserve, you fought for that right. And I just, I just won't stop. And I can't stop until like, I, 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 I allow myself to be as vulnerable as I can and continue to push myself to help other veterans. I just can't stop. Yeah, Mark, uh, you, about a year ago, Tim uh, stood in SunTrust Park uh, right before a Braves game and told this story to the entire stadium. So you really have to admire his courage and uh, his commitment to his, uh, his fellow veterans for doing something like that. It's quite remarkable to open himself up and just lay it out there. No, absolutely. I mean, again, you know, this courage comes in all different forms, you know, and that's both in and out of combat. And uh, to that end, uh, anybody who chooses to seek help and better their lives and empower themselves to be able to, you know, just get out of bed every day, um, I, I think deserves some sort of recognition. Um, you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, on a large scale, but just from a loved one or a friend, you know, saying, Hey, you're, you know, you're okay. We're, we're with you. Um, obviously the suicide rate where we are is, is out of control. Um, and so much so it, it's crazy now because veterans are, are getting, I guess the term is ballsier. You know, they're doing it in VA parking lots now, and it, you know, because it's not enough just to to kill yourself. You have to make a bigger statement in doing it. Um, and and when that's starting to happen, it's it's alarming that uh, we're, we're still struggling with how to fix this problem. We're still struggling with a solution 
um, to this. And I think the overarching theme is literally just about um, its reach. You know, it's can can you get to these people in time uh, and these 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 veterans who are hurting um, in order that they don't seek that as an option? Yeah, I think you're right, Mark. And I know that um, the treatment that's provided by the the amazing doctors and clinicians at the Emory uh, uh, Healthcare Veterans Program, uh, they have uh, clinical outcomes now which prove that if you can go through the intensive outpatient program, your suicidal thoughts and actions drop way, way down. So the program is not designed to prevent suicide, but it's a, it's a secondary impact or secondary effect that's occurring as a result of that treatment. And um, I know that uh, they're going to publish some findings related to this. So, sir, when you reflect on 30 years of service, I mean, it, is it fair to say that you've, you're making more of an impact now post-service than you did while you were in? Well, let's be accurate, Mark. It's 35 and a half years. Sorry, sir. 30 plus, 35 and a half plus. <laughs> Didn't want to short you, sir. I, I earned apologize. every year of that. Yeah. yeah. That, hey, listen, no. I, there's no debating that whatsoever. <laughs> no, I, I think... Um, for me, it's a chance to, uh, to influence, to advocate, and to make life better for veterans. That, uh, for, uh, for me, that's very appealing. Um, uh, and it's, frankly, it's the reason I'm part of this program, the reason I'm teamed up with my battle buddy here, Tim, to uh, bring more veterans into the program, get them through it, and uh, allow them to have a better life. Tim? I, one of the things I just want to get out is like, I, I think as all of us being mil in the military, what, you know, different branches, but I think we need, I think we need to hold each other accountable. I think we need to hold, you know, our team members accountable. I think we need to, I think we need to reach out and help out to just continue to help out all of, all of these people who we, one we've served with and people who are now serving. And I just, I think it's so important to change the culture of the mindset that that PTSD and the feelings you have are never going to go away. I had suicidal thoughts. You want to get real? I wanted to commit suicide. I almost did. I wanted to. I didn't want to live. That's how much I didn't want to be. I just I woke up every day not happy. I didn't know how to fix it. I never thought I was going to find happiness. I thought I was always going to be stuck with these memories. You know what? Yeah, I still have them. But like... I was taught through this program that like you are capable of change, not just, not just, you know, this special forces guy who's seen all this stuff, but down to the basic of someone who just experienced combat in any kind of way. It could, you owe it to yourself as a person to be happy. You owe it to your family. You owe it to, to, to the freedoms you fought for. You owe it, you just owe it to everything you fought for that you need to get better. You deserve to get better and you can get better, but we need to, I just want to change that mindset that like, there's nothing so little and there's nothing too big that can't be fixed, but you have to be willing to want to change. You have to be willing. Let's say hypothetically speaking, and uh, you come across an individual and they tell you that they're a veteran, you know, uh, are you as bold enough to ask them, if they are okay and do they need help? I mean, cause we talk about the reach problem, you know, you, you run across a lot of veterans, especially if you are a veteran, we seem to attract our own, but to that end, I guess I'm wondering, um, you know, what do you, when you encounter them, what do you say? How do you, how do you reach somebody that you don't know if they need reaching? Well, I think amongst veterans, it's, uh, it's easy to talk about that, Mark. I, I know that, um, you know, when I run into my buddies out there, friends and people, I have had the, you know, the privilege of serving with, um, you know, I'll ask them, you doing okay? You doing all right? And then uh, based on their reaction, we may go a little deeper with that. But I'll, I'll tell you that they're serving general officers and they're serving command sergeants major and everything in between who are suffering from PTSD. As you know, in the, in the culture that Tim has already mentioned, uh, we, we don't encourage that to be dealt with necessarily. But we've got to make sure there's a mechanism so when they leave the military, there's a catcher's mitt that we can roll them into, whether it's the VA or the Warrior Care Network, to, to address this issue. So, yeah, I, I don't have any 
problem asking them, hey, buddy, you doing all right? And, and I it, just think it, it leads, as Tim and I have talked, it leads to deeper conversations. It does. And I think the key, the key for, for me and the people I've talked to, my brother's pushed a couple people my way to talk to about it, is you, you as the veteran have to be vulnerable and willing to be vulnerable with other veterans. And like, yes, I have those same thoughts. Or I felt that same way. Oh yeah, you, you can get through that. Yes, I've like I've worked through this through this program. It was hard. I had to work every day, homework, listening, watching IEDs go off, doing all these things that terrify me to death. But that's how you prove. That's how you get better. It's by looking fear in its you know in its eye and just and just knowing that like it doesn't matter. Just keep pushing, keep going after that fear. Because if you're not like if you're not going after that fear, you're not doing something. You need to. You need to continue to push yourself. And for me, it was just looking fear in the eye and realizing, realizing I could do it, that I can make it through it. But I also, but I also realized that I couldn't do it on my own and I needed, I needed a support system. And that support system started off with veteran or with Emory veterans program. And then they gave me the tools to get to where I want or I am today, where I can do it on my own, reapplying the stuff they taught me, reaching out to Burke, reaching out to people and continuing continuously being vulnerable and opening myself to to this these kinds of you know these kinds of, of, of events and the website is emoryhealthcare.org slash veterans that's where everybody can go if they're or they can go to any emory facility does that work as well yeah probably best to go to the website start there the the telephone number is there as well and i would just again encourage uh, any veteran who's struggling with ptsd or knows someone who is to please tell them to pick up the phone, make the call, and let's get this process started and get this monkey off your back. You can beat PTSD. EmoryHealthCare.org slash veterans or 888-514-5345. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for being part of the Hazard Ground Podcast. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Proud to be here. Thank you. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell, and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.